Welcome to chapter four for exercise programming for special populations. Talking about metabolic conditions and disorders, if it'll go. Let's see. All right, skip the objectives. Lifestyle and disease risk. Chronic metabolic disorders like type 2 diabetes, lipidemia, and obesity are strongly linked to lifestyle choices. Only a small percentage, 3 to 8% of people in the United States follow low-risk lifestyle. Is that not sad or what? Um, especially you look in these days and times where they talk about how, you know, how uh, COVID-19 affects those that are already in really poor health and how much of that is actually under our, um, you know, we actually have enough power or strength within ourselves to take very good care of ourselves where something like that really poses very little risk, you know, you know, like, I mean, me personally, I take very good care of myself. I'm not worried if I get it. Now I have to worry about whether I get it and pass it on to other people that don't take very good care of themselves. But again, if you think about this, we have three to 8% of people in the U S follow a low risk lifestyle. Right. And again, these other things, type two diabetes, dyslipidemia, obesity, and you, then you look at, you know, folks that have heart disease and lung problems and strokes and, you know, high risk for cancers. Um, not the type of life that I would want. Um, yet people choose to uh, disavow any of this and go on to um, have those type of problems anyways, right? And so when you think about that, you know, I mean, it does seem silly. Now, again, there's a lot of other stuff that plays into that, right? You know, again, we like our foods. Yes, you know, it can be um, physically taxing and, and take your time to go work out and you may not like it and, the, and those type of things. And we talked about that in the previous chapter that exercise doesn't have to not be fun. <laughs> you know, people have this idea that exercise has to be in the gym, exercise has to be on a treadmill, exercise has to be lifting weights, it has to do this. And, you know, again, to some people, they do like that and they're like, okay, that sounds great. But again, you think about that, it, maybe that's the small three to eight percent of the population, you know. Where a lot of folks, maybe if you say, you know, if you like going for hikes and you live near an area where you can just go hike all the time, or you like to, you know, go bike riding with your friends, or you like to play sports, or maybe if you live by the beach, you like to surf, you like to do this, you know, things that are very active, but they might seem as fun, right? You know, so if you, you have a group of friends that loves to play football, right? And you're an adult now and you're like, yeah, but we don't play football. Well, why not? You know, maybe tackling's not a good idea, but getting out and playing, you know, like if you had a group of friends that wanted to meet every single day and go play like an hour's worth of like touch football or flag football or something along those, I, you know, you're like, yeah, but we're in our forties. You don't do that, but why not? Right. You know, you guys get out there, you, you know, you get running around, running routes. You do, you know, like you go play for an hour, you know, you start getting in better shape, you start playing for a couple hours a day. I mean, and you get done and you're like, man, that was a lot of fun, but you don't even feel like you did exercise, but you were sweating and breathing out. You know, like, there's nothing wrong with that. And again, we, we as fitness professionals got to get it out of our head that we got to always get people in the gym. We got to get them on the treadmills. We got to, you know, maybe that doesn't work for everybody because again, psychologically, we've got to find something that gets them doing something. Now, at some point, maybe it'd be more advantageous for them to be doing some things in the, you know, like on the free weights and doing some things, you know, a little, some other cardio things as well, but that's not where they're at. And this all or nothing principle is not helping. Okay. So obesity um, or excess body fat is a result of chronic imbalance of energy intake versus output. So uh, taking in too much and not getting enough out of your body. Um, I don't care what you read on the internet, whether it's sugar or carbohydrates, or you got to do keto to lose weight, or you got to do intermittent fasting, or you can't eat after eight o'clock at night or this, that, or the other, all a bunch of garbage. Right. So if you think about this within a 24 hour period, you've got to, if you want to stay at your weight, you've got to eat exactly what you output. 
if you want to lose weight, you got to eat less than what you output. If you're going to gain weight, you got to eat more than what you output. Now, again, we can look at that day to day. We can look at that on a weekly basis. So within a week, you know, you got to eat so many calories versus output so many calories. You know, however you look at it, within a certain amount of time, if the numbers match exactly, nothing's going to change. Um, if one of the one of the scales is higher than the other, then either you're going to gain or lose weight. That that's it. Doesn't matter what you're eating. It doesn't matter how healthy or unhealthy if you're looking at it in terms of like, am I eating vegetables or am I eating cookies, right? And both have their place in your diet before you, somebody like, just like, I can't have it. No, no, no. Both have their place in your diet. But, you know, if you're eating like more of your fruits and veggies and things that are like high, high density in um, vitamins, minerals, and so forth, versus those things that are just more higher calorie, not really vitamins and minerals and all that. Um, then it doesn't matter. You know, you can lose weight eating cookies all day. You can gain weight eating nothing but fruits and vegetables. It's possible. So understand that it, it's all energy. That, that's the thing. It's, it, it's just an energy imbalance. Um, again, there are genetic contributors. Um, you may have like higher, lower levels, certain hormones, you may have certain glands, you know, like thyroid gland that doesn't work near as well, um, so on and so forth. But again, um, that will not be the sole cause of your obesity. I, I hate that they even put rarely because um, the thing is, is, you know, if you're living, your body's burning energy, you have to burn energy to stay alive. So some people may be able to get away with eating like 3000 calories. Some people may only be able to get away with 1000 based on doing the exact same things physically because they have different things going on within their scope of um, their genetic contributors. But it doesn't mean that weight loss is impossible for those other folks. It's just harder. And again, you know, the doctors may be able to help with that as well, right? Um, so again, obesity has increased rapidly in the last 30 years. And approximately 30% of our population is obese, um, which is having a body, ma body mass index or BMI of 30 or greater. Again, it, it, depending on body fat percentages, that's a whole different scale, right? Um, and then more than half of the population is overweight being in 25, 29. So when you look at 50 and 30, we're looking at around 80% of our population has excess body fat to some degree. Um, and again, overweight is one of those weird, tricky ones because some folks can be healthy overweight. Um, a lot of folks are not healthy overweight. So, you know, again, uh, you know, it's best to try to get into that, like, uh, you know, it's best to stay out of the overweight. Now, again, I don't like basing that on the BMI scales. Um, you know, it's better to look at actual body fat percentage because some of you all might have some muscle mass, which also gets counted into your BMI, unfortunately. Okay. Western diet contains high amounts of fats and simple sugars promoting weight gain and resulting in symptoms related to chronic disease, such as inflammation, vascular dysfunction. Now, again, it's not those particular contents the problem is is those are contents we tend to eat in mass amounts because they taste good so don't think it oh it's because we eat um simple sugars you know they say high amounts of fat so that one kind of plays into the whole you know calorie thing especially when you know that one gram equals nine kilocals of um you know per gram of fat versus you know like four in in uh carbs and four in in proteins but um, you know, we eat a high amount of fats because again, fats taste good and simple sugars, again, um, they just taste good, right? So those high, those, those, we eat high amounts of them. It, it just means we're getting too many calories, right? Not, not necessarily from those particular things. They just are easy to overeat, right? It's easy to eat 30 cookies than it is to eat 30 pieces of broccoli, right? Um, so again, we, you know, you get a lot of symptoms related to chronic disease, such as inflammation, vascular dysfunction. Now, again, a lot of people think food causes inflammation 
No, the, if, the only time food will cause inflammation is if there's already disease present. But again, when we eat all that, then we start getting chronic diseases, which then start the inflammation and vascular dysfunction. Then sometimes when you, the foods that you eat after that point, you know, or other things that go on in your life, you know, if you walk too much, you know, even exercise might cause inflammation because your body's in such a bad place at that point, right? So this is compounded by generally low levels of physical activity and long periods of inactivity. Again, we just don't do much. And especially now in COVID season, you know, people are staying home more and doing a whole lot less, right? Um, I bet you our obesity rates and overweight rates have um, skyrocketed during this time. Um, obesity also interferes with normal appetite control caused by lack of response to leptin, the satiety hormone. So again, if you don't know what satiety means, it's like the feeling of like feeling like either full or you just feel, I, you know, um, I, I don't like the full feeling because sometimes people feel like, you know, they'll say, oh, no, that means like stuff. No, it just means like you're satisfied. Like think satiety and set, like you, you feel like you're not necessarily hungry anymore. You don't have to eat, right? Some people may feel like stuffed or bloated or whatever. Some people just feel like, okay, I'm good, right? I mean, it's just your, your interpretation of the response, right? Um, and again, you get more adipose cells, exercise may reverse this problem, okay? Medications, no medication produced can successfully address all the causes and symptoms underlying obesity, although a number of medications are approved to treat obesity, um, if you look on four one, they have a list of that. Obese individuals may also be taking a variety of other medications that treat their obesity related disease. So again, that we live in a society is like, all right, well, I'll do what I'm going to do until something's broke. Again, you know, I, I equate this to a same thing with your car. If you buy a brand new car and you never change the oil, you never do the routine maintenance and all that. Eventually when something breaks, it breaks, right? And it can cause a lot of other things to break. It can be very expensive. Sometimes you may have destroyed the car and you got to go with a new car. Problem is with your body, yeah, you can break one thing and it breaks a lot of other things. It can be very expensive to fix. The problem is you just can't go get another body. <laughs> so, you know, you run into some issues with that. So effects of exercise, energy balance is a net sum of resting metabolic rate, your RMR and the thermic effect of digestion or thermic effect of food. Is that's what the F, I don't know why they put digestion on there, but, um, and then your thermic effect of activity, the EAPA. So all these things play into it. So here's the thing. A lot of people think, okay, well, I got to eat like six times a day for the thermic effect of food. Now take this into consideration. Thermic effect of food usually contributes to about five to 10%, uh, depending on who you are, what you eat and how often you eat and so on. Right. So if everybody's at re relatively around 5%, and those that eat often and things going on in their body can get up to 10, but you're only making a 5% change at, you know, at best, most people are somewhere between the five to 7%. So 2%. Okay. So again, you know, if you eat three times a day versus seven times a day, something like that, the seven times isn't going to make that big of a difference, right? It may be, you know, over the, the, the time of a year, maybe you lose a pound or two pounds or something, you know, like a few extra pounds, right? Now, again, if it's worth it to you, do it. Um, if that completely throws off your lifestyle, don't worry about that one. Uh, you know, a lot of times people try to play into this whole thermic effect of food and make it into the bigger deal that it is. It's a nice little tool that helps very little, but don't, make it consume your life and now plan your life around your, you know, like I got to eat it this time. I'm going to eat this. You know, the only time this really plays out is like with bodybuilders and stuff like that, because they're doing all this little fine tuning stuff because, you know, every little thing counts at that point. Right. If you're not a bodybuilder, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, what we got to get up is the RMR and your activity levels. Right. Um, so reducing body weight is optimally achieved by combining a decrease in caloric intake with a comprehensive exercise program with both aerobic and resistance with a target of one to two pounds per week of weight loss, primarily from fat loss. So this, you know, 30 pounds in 30 days stuff is nonsense. Now people do it. The problem with it is, is there are always things that you can't continue to do. 
when you can't continue to do them, you tend to go back to old habits, or then you compensate for the fact that you're even more hungry than you used to be, and you tend to gain everything back, right? Now, again, those of you that are in really, really bad shape, you know, like you're hundreds of pounds overweight, um, even if you're doing things more at a slow approach and carefully at first, because your body's now doing things, it's not, you know, you may see some greater weight loss at the beginning because you have greater strides to make. But as you continue with that same behavior, you'll start to notice that that weight loss becomes less and less. Um, that doesn't mean it's not working. It just means your body um, is now adjusting as things are going on. And, and that's, that's okay, right? So your goal is one to two pounds. A lot of people think, well, that's not very much per week, but it is. You know, if you think about this, if you lose one pound a week for a year, that's 52 pounds. That's huge. If you lose two pounds a week per year, that's 104. That's huge, right? Um, and so again, you got to think in terms of not like how can I look next month, but how will I look a year from now and not be extremely starved or not have worked myself out to death so much that I'm injured or I'm just sick of it or whatever else, right? So uh, think about it in those um, terms. And again, primarily from fat loss, a lot of people think when they're losing weight, it's only fat. No, um, you could be getting more dehydrated because you're working out more, not drinking enough um, you could be, you know, losing, um, depending on, you know, like how much aerobics you do and things like that versus like weight training or no weight, training. you know, um, you may be losing some muscle mass, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of things that you could be losing, um, besides just fat with that. Again, if you're not eating as many carbs, the, the carbs hold water again, you know, nothing wrong with carbs. Okay. But carbs hold water. So again, as, as you don't eat as many of them because you're cutting it, you know, hopefully you're doing it healthy and just cutting everything down. Um, again, there's a lot less water in that as well. Okay. So uh, you take that all in consideration. Neither diet or exercise alone are effective in achieving and maintaining healthy fat loss key is healthy, right? So you don't want to do one or the, uh, you know, having a healthier diet, again, doesn't mean that you don't get to eat fun things, just healthier um, and having good exercise, right? You want to do them both. Okay. Um, so without exercise, weight loss can come from both fat and lean tissue, but loss of lean tissue makes weight maintenance and loss more difficult and it negatively affects your RMR. Now, again, the whole thing about muscle mass and resting metabolic rate gets, again, another one of those things that gets over simplified and over exaggerated. Um, there is a relationship with active muscle and having a faster metabolism, but it's not like what you what people try to say, nah, you got to bulk up and be like, a. it's not quite that simple. Okay. And it doesn't work quite like that. Um, also the thing is too, is as you lose weight, your metabolism slows down a little bit. Um, so even fat, any excess weight, whatever it is, does kind of speed up your metabolism. So a lot of folks that say, oh, I, you know, I'm fat because I have a slow metabolism, actually, because you're fat, you probably have a much higher metabolism than you will when you're like 20 pounds lighter. Okay. <laughs> um, but whether good or, you know, like whether it's active muscle or it's adipose fat, it, it does play into having um, a slightly higher metabolism, all right? So again, it's your body's way of saying, look, we got to get rid of some of this, right? I'm even giving you a little bit faster metabolism if you'll get moving and do something, okay? Um, and again, this is without, you know, having any of the other issues we talked about earlier. So optimally preventing weight gain is much easier task than losing weight. Um, you know, so if you're eating and, you know, like your weight's relatively normal, uh, you know, like whatever you're doing now, it's kind of easier to kind of maintain what you're doing than to create a whole new program because you got out of shape, right? Or, you know, because now, you know, not only from the physical aspect, but from the mental and psych, you know, like, you know, like just the amount of work you got to do and, and how that's going to play on you psychologically and just being mentally tired and all that. Right. So fitness professionals should strive to encourage individuals to maintain healthy lifestyle with reasonable diet and sustain enjoyable physical activity that's integrated into their lifestyles. Now, again, we're playing more like they said, you know, OK, that's ideal. But as you see, 80 percent of our population's out of shape. And probably even more now during covid. So what does that mean? We're not playing from like taking a, you know, like if you think of like an athlete taking a great athlete and keeping them a great athlete, we're taking non-athletes and turning them into 
NFL players, you know, or MLB play. I mean, that, that's really what we're playing with now, you know, for the most part. We, we got to take people where they're at and move them, you know, and it's harder, right? There's four general types of diets. And again, these are just generalized, right? Yeah, low calorie balanced, which is optimal. Low fat, high carb, low carb, which is high fat, high protein, or both, or low carb, low fat with high protein. Now, again, the reason I say just lowering your calorie, now, again, your calorie balance may be not balanced well. And when they say balanced, it doesn't mean we do 33%, 33%, 33%. Um, typically you'll, you'll consume more carbs than anything just because your body burns more carbs than anything. Um, fats and, you know, and balance for you is going to depend on what you do and what you're trying to go for. So when I say that, you know, like if you're a, uh, you know, if you're not going for athletics, you're not trying to bulk up a lot of, you know, like a lot of lean mass and things like that. You don't really need to have, you don't really need to have like a, uh, replace more with the protein versus the fats. You don't need to, it may still be beneficial, but you don't need to necessarily, and you can still lose weight and, and everything. Now, again, um, most protein will not play into your overall calories. Um, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, having excess, uh, there's been a lot of really cool studies with excess protein where they, uh, they're basically, they got folks and they're balanced and they're making me to crud ton more protein and they still see weight loss even though it you know you would think okay they're they just added food <laughs> um because again they'll see some fat mass loss with it and they're adding lean muscle and and so on and so forth so we're not going to get too much into that because that's not the right chapter and right book for this but just to kind of throw that in there um all these dots can be effective but should be evaluated for adherence to the concepts of the energy balance and are they sustainable, right? So again, when people tell me they want to do keto, that's, I, I always ask them like, well, do you like to eat carbohydrates? If they're like, nah, I could care less for them. I'm like, you know, all right, then that's fine. Cause you'll just eat whatever ones you need to eat to keep, you know, your, your, your low carbs or whatever, and you're good. But I really find that that where people are like, yeah, I don't like carbs. And I'm like, okay, so you're never going to really eat much of the carbs you like to eat ever again. I guess that's what I have to do. Well, no, it's not what you have to do. And a lot of times that's the thing is if there's foods that you like, uh, the, the, I'm never going to eat that again, never pans out. You know, there's very few people that are like, when they make that decision, they can always stick to it. So um, I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of, you know, like now low fats, one thing, the like, really low fat to where you avoid foods again uh -uh, right so if anything is i'm going to avoid something i like to eat it's not going to work okay um again individual environment social support and you know uh, economics and all that can play into success of the programs as well right um so again obese individuals are less tolerant and more injury prone in response to weight bearing exercise again uh, you know, you think about it, you know, if my typical body say is like 170 for me or something, um, and I'm doing jumps, you know, my knees will take me jumping up and down and landing and all that fine. Now, if I'm carrying 300 pounds on a frame, that's really meant more to carry 170 and I'm jumping up and down. Yeah. You know, it's going to be a lot harder on my knees, my hips, my ankles and more injury. Right. Um, so again, exercise prescription needs to be lower in duration, frequency, intensity to, you know, make sure that we're not putting folks at risk by getting them exercise, right? Shorter bouts of five to 15 minutes, several times a day may be more optimal for some folks too. again, you know, you can't get somebody running for 30 minutes straight, <laughs> you know, if they've never done it. Right. So again, just have them do what they can, let them rest, have them do some more once they're ready, you know, it's fine. Okay. It doesn't, it's not all or nothing approach. Robotic exercise should progress up to 300 minutes per week um, or more of moderate intense activities, supplement weight loss from caloric restrictions. I, again, I, you can mix a lot of things and it, um, depending on the type of, 
aerobics they do um you know like if you're doing harder aerobics versus like long slow distance stuff and things like that you know you can do it in shorter amount of times so you're right it, it can be higher intense you know they can have a mix of low intense moderate and high yeah you know so again it's just kind of giving you like an idea right resistance training does not result in significant weight loss but may prevent significant loss of fat free mass um and again depending on how you do the resistance training can play into that okay Exercise modifications, precautions, contraindications. Um, you know, individuals with obesity are prone to musculoskeletal injuries, disease, uh, particularly osteoarthritis of hips, low back, neck, knees. Um, carefully graded progressions, critical both aerobic and resistance, may need to initially be performed intermittent, again, five to 15 minutes a day. And professionals should focus on increasing duration and frequency before the intensity. Right. So it, we just do these little moves just to get them going more, doing a little bit here, doing a little bit there. Right. Um, exercise modifications, precautions, contraindications. Some machines may need to be adapted for the individual. Right. You know, they're too tall, too short, too fat, too whatever. Right. Um, you know, uh, again, you may have to modify, you know, you may have to avoid certain machines and so on and so forth. You know, they may have knee problems or hip problems, whatever. Okay, um, so with that said too, be sensitive, right? If there's a machine you're not sure your client's gonna fit on, it's better to avoid it altogether than to try it. And then you're like, oh, you too big. Nobody wants to go through that experience, right? So just, you know, be careful with that, okay? Um, again, due to high risk for metabolic disorders, uh, percent fat, weight, blood pressure, fasting, blood glucose and lipids should be assessed every three to six months just to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, you can monitor blood pressure regularly before, um, during, and after. During's a little hard. <laughs> um, you know, like you, if they're feeling fine, you can kind of just, eh, we'll see how you are after. Um, if anything's concerning you, you might want to check it. All right. Um, Encourage adequate fluid intake. Again, that's the thing too. Fluid's going to mess with their weight. So again, that's why you don't want them going on the scale all the time and, and everything else. Because again, they may increase their fluid intake, which is really good. Okay. But their weight might like, hey, it's not moving like they want to because they actually have a better fluid regimen than before. Right. Um, and again, um, you want to maintain thermoneutral environments. You don't want them working outside in South Florida. Let's for example, right? Because um, they're prone to hyperthermia. Um, I think everybody down here is prone to hyperthermia. You walk outside and you're dying, right? Type 2 diabetes is a disease characterized by re resistance to insulin or underproduction of insulin, preventing adequate control of blood glucose and leading eventually to a variety of other complications. Classification criteria listed in 4.4, type 2 diabetes is 30 times more likely in individuals with greater than 35 BMI compared to normal. Um, again, it, it's got a very high lifestyle capacity versus genetic capacity in, in comparison. Um, of all the types of diabetes, type 2 is the most common, accounting for 90-95% of cases in the U.S. Um, and again, it's mostly lifestyle, right? So you kind of bring it on yourself when you think about it. Um, so again, normal pre-diabetic and diabetic looking at fasting and um, just random. So at random is a hard one to deal with this way. A lot of times they make you do the fasting because again, random two hours after, well, most people don't know how much glucose they've had, right? So you know, like, well, how much, how much, you know, like how many carbs are you? Most people aren't going to really know. Right. Um, and so again, that's why we usually do the fasting. Um, now, um, again, if you want to know these numbers, you'll, you'll have to do a fasting test to see where you fall in that. Okay. High blood glucose associated with a number of related symptoms, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, um, coronary artery disease, they have the slash myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack, um, I, one leads to the other, right? Cerebral vascular accident, which is a stroke, hypertension, kidney disease, high triglycerides, low HDLs, eye disease, 
Um, neuropathies and autonomic dysfunction and peripheral artery disease are all associated with type 2 diabetes, right? And again, taking care of yourself helps to not have these things. Um, medications for improving insulin resistance, reducing glucose secretion by the liver and stimulating insulin production by pancreatic beta cells. Um, there's different type two uh, diabetes medications that help. Again, they're in 4.2 synthetic insulins. Again, for those that um, are now insulin dependent and medications for related conditions are also common and must be accounted for. So again, you may have somebody that's um, taken medications for the diabetes, plus they have heart issues or, you know, you know, the, their eye issues and, and so on and so forth. And they're taking stuff for that or they're autoimmune, they're, you know, it, it's a mess that for the most part, if you take care of yourself, you don't deal with it. You know, very few people will have to deal with it. They're doing a good job, right? Exercise is vital for the control of blood glucose as muscle activity stimulates glucose uptake by the muscle cells independent of insulin. When combined with improved diet and comprehensive lifestyle modification programs, exercise significantly reduces risk of developing type 2 in those over 55. Okay, And actually, acute bouts of cardio um, will increase insulin sensitivity for anywhere up to 48, like up to 48 hours or 72 hours or something like that too. It's one of the few acute exercise effects that we have, right? Resistance training also has positive effects on reducing risk for type 2 diabetes can stimulate glucose uptake by the muscles and these effects seem to be superior to pharmacological interventions. So type 2 diabetics should start with 10 minute bouts of aerobic exercise five to seven days a week, intensity about 50 to 85%. Um, Mode should be walking, biking, swimming, or other large muscle group rhythmic and continuous exercises. Um, if weight loss is desired, work up to 60 minutes per session or 300 minutes per week. Um, resistance training should be done for the whole body every 48 hours or so with two to three sets of eight to 12 reps using large muscle multi-joint exercises. Um, lower intense will be necessary for beginners. Flexibility training will be important since range of motion is sometimes problematic in diabetics and use one to two stretches per muscle group held for 10 to 30 seconds, right? Um, medical clearance is desired, especially with comorbidities and medical supervised fitness tests may be necessary. Blood glucose should be monitored regularly before active exercise. Um, if it's above 200, exercise should be avoided until it's reduced. Uh, exceptions can be made if urine ketone bodies are absent. In that case, light to moderate is okay. Again, you, you check with the docs. If it's below 100, the client needs to eat something to get their blood glucose up um, and also be aware of possible dehydration. If a client suffers from retinopathy, avoid large increases in blood pressure caused by vigorous exercises. It can cause, is it can cause issues with the eyes pressure can get too high. Clients with autonomic neuropathy, kidney disease, peripheral artery disease, peripheral neuropathy should be referred to medically supervised program, not be at your UFIT or Planet Fitness. Um, be aware of comorbidities and plant exercise based on those as well. Autoimmune disease in which pancreatic beta cells are gradually destroyed. Insulin must be taken exogenously to control their blood glucose. Can occur at any age, but most likely before age 30. This is type 1 diabetics. Um, 5 to 10% of diabetics are type 1, right? So just small percentage. And this is the one that is 100% genetic, right? You can't cause it. It's just you're, you have it right? Ketoacidosis can occur if blood glucose builds up, resulting in use of protein and fats as energy sources with symptoms, including dry mouth, nausea, ab pain, muscle weakness, shortness of breath, and mental confusion. Medications, insulin is injected intermuscularly or in lower abdomen, um, inhaled or through insulin pumps, but not um, in pill forms. Rapid acting insulin reduces blood glucose in about 15 minutes, but only lasts for several hours. Short acting insulin reduces blood glucose 30 minutes, continues three to six hours. Intermittent acting insulin does not reduce blood glucose until two to four hours later, but it's effective for 18 hours. And long acting insulin takes several hours to begin affecting blood glucose and keeps levels relatively even for 24. Reduced HbAc1 or a, HbA1Cs um, indicate 
indic indicative of average blood glucose levels, improved uh, body comp, lowered blood pressure, blood lipids, decreased mortality, um, can cause hypoglycemia during or after exercise or during subsequent sleep. So again, monitor you know, food intake or have them eat food if they need to. Moderate intensity is best at controlled blood glucose. So again, exercise helps type one diabetics, um, you know, uh, not going to cure their disease, but it helps them with many of their other issues, right? Um, so guidelines for exercise prescription are the same as for type two diabetics, but considerations for controlling blood glucose are as follows. Um, if their blood glucose is low, they need to eat 15 to 30 grams of carbs for a session lasting 30 minutes or longer. If it's between 90 and 150, they don't need to consume carbs until blood glucose is below 150. For 250 to 350, exercise should only be performed if the ketones are low and only at light to moderate. Um, and anything over 350, delay exercise with high ketones or administer insulin if ketones are low, and then exercise at moderate intensity until blood glucose is less than 250. Normal blood lipoprotein concentrations. Uh, pr potentially increased risk for atherosclerosis, heart attack, and stroke is, is your definition for dyslipidemia. Uh, characterized by elevated total cholesterol, low density lipoproteins and triglycerides, and low levels of high density lipoproteins. Um, components uh, of blood lipids, uh, total cholesterol represents some of all forms of the cholesterol, LDLs with VLDLs. Um, are the major carriers of cholesterol in the blood and deposit cholesterol in the lining of blood vessels contributing to atherosclerosis. Uh, chylomicrons are small fat and protein molecules that transport fats from intestine to the liver and HCLs can remove cholesterol from blood and transport it to the liver. Um, so again, here's your lipid profiles um, with LDL, HCL and your triglycerides um, where you should be where it's okay to be, where you're borderline high, high risk and very high. And there's a lot of different medications for dyslipidemia. Um, they're all in 4-4. Um, exercise and lifestyle management, nutritional adjustments are necessary to improve blood lipid profile, including reduced fat, increasing fiber intake, reducing overall caloric intake, combined with dietary changes, aerobic exercise, decreased total our triglycerides and increased HDL um, resistance training has also been found to be effective. Um, aerobic training involves rhythmic movements, large muscle groups, blah, 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 like walking, jogging, you know, stair everything we talked about before, smaller bouts, trying to get up to about 60 minutes a day. Resistance training with large muscle groups, exercise two to three days a week, 50, 85% one rep max loads, and flexibility training for all muscle groups can be done three to seven days a week. Individuals on stands may experience enhanced muscle damage or pain and blunted gains in strength or endurance. Use low intensity to start, carefully monitor their symptoms, refer clients to a doc if necessary. Hypo and hyperthyroidism. So hypo is unproductive of thyrosine by the thyroid gland or underproduction. Um, symptoms include fatigue, cold intolerance, muscle aches, pains, loss of bone mineral, Lower cardiac output, bradycardia, can lead to goiter, potentially fatal myxedemia, swelling of tissues and skin, can be caused by iodine deficiencies, autoimmune disease, and thyroid removal. Um, hyperthyroidism is overproduction of triadoxothyroid or thyrosine. Most common cause of grave is Graves' disease. Thyroid hormone regulates metabolic rate and overproduction causes nervousness, tachycardia, increased cardiac output, heat intolerance, and muscle weakness. Through different mechanisms, both hypo and hyper can increase exercise intolerance, slow recovery from exercise, lower the anaerobic threshold, and elevate respiratory stress. So medications, hypothyroid Treatments involve thyroid replacement therapy and forms of synthetic thyrosine. There can be a number of side effects on the heart function, nervous system, muscular system, and metabolic control. Elevated blood pressure and heart rate should be expected and accounted for. Um, hyperthyroid treatment goal is primarily to prevent thyroid tox toxicosis and 
concomitant heart rhythm disturbances, antithyroid drugs are given and doses are adjusted until youth, youth, euthyroidism, known as thyroid hormone levels, is reached. Beta blockers may also be prescribed to prevent effects of thyroid toxicosis. But then exercise, exercise heart rate cannot be used to monitor the intensities, right? When you do that, you got to use a talk test. It's the best one to do in that instance. Um, hypothyroidism, low, lower cholesterol, increased metabolic rate, improved mood and weight loss. Hyperthyroidism, with exercise, they'll see reduced joint muscle stiffness, improved bone density, increased muscle tissue. Um, Exercise recommendations, uh, looking for 10 primary goals, establish euthyroid state and carefully monitor the client for symptoms. After euthyroid state is established, guidelines for healthy individuals can be followed. Chronic kidney disease, um, anywhere from one to five on severity um, based on stages. Um, stage five is in stage renal disease. Individuals are on dialysis to filter blood and they need a kidney transplant to survive. Kidneys become damaged due to inflammation, high blood pressure, high glucose levels, and others. I mean, their ability to remove waste from the blood, which also results in damage to other organs. Muscle fatigue is common and functional capacity with in stage renal disease is only 60 to 7% normal. So, exercise testing should be done in clinical environment. As the end-stage renal disease progresses, individuals are likely to be less physically active and their functional capacity will continue to get worse. Medications uh, will be administered to treat comorbidities such as heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. Most common medications are diuretics and euthropoietin stimulant agents. Exercise professionals need to have a working knowledge of the effects of the common medications. Um, functional capacity increases in similar manner, manner to those um, with in-stage renal disease. Um, there's also increased ability to carry out activities of daily living, increase in muscle strength with resistance training, low, lower blood pressure, reduced inflammation, decreased cardiovascular risk factors are known effects of aerobic and resistance training both. Um, recommendations similar to those with comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, but should be modified based on functional capacity of each person. Aerobic ac exercise should be carried out most days of the week, moderate um, for 20 to 60 total minutes per day. Resistance training should be done two to three days a week with one set of 10 to 15 reps per exercise at 70, 75 of one rep max. All right, you are welcome. Um, that's it. Chapter five tomorrow. Any questions, you know where to reach me.